Well, we're going to continue our series today on Prayer 101. And what we've done so far, we've talked about what prayer is, talked about the motivation for prayer, about how much joy and satisfaction comes from it. And then last week, we talked about the greatest example of prayer, which is the Lord's Prayer. And so we talked about last week that maybe if you're like me and you're not very good at painting, you need someone to give you, oh, I'm sorry, our, our title for our message today is Praising God in Prayer. And like we talked about last week, maybe if you're not very good at painting, you need someone to give you an example of prayer, you know, happy trees and everything like that. So someone is painting you or showing you how to paint. So that's kind of what we did last week. We showed um, an example of how to pray with the Lord's Prayer. But maybe if you're also like me and you're really, really, really bad at painting, you need someone when they're showing you the example to go very slowly, to show it very much in detail. Uh, what, one week I we have a painting class that comes every so often on Saturdays, and I participated in it. And for most of the people, they think it's fun. For me, it was very stressful. Because I'm really bad at that. And, you know, the lady is showing you how to paint the next thing. And I'm like, slow down, slow down. You know, I need you to explain more because I'm really bad at it. Well, what we're going to do in these next couple weeks, we're going to take the Lord's Prayer, put it into categories that are easy to remember, and look at them more in depth so that we can further understand how to better pray. So a good way to organize it, I didn't come up with this. Someone else showed me this. But if this is an acronym, P-R-A-Y, for prayer. And the first part is praise. You have P for praise. R is repent. A is ask. Y is yield. So this is a way to categorize the Lord's Prayer. And so today we're going to talk about the P, the praise part, on how to incorporate this into our prayer. So turn with me to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, we're going to look at two psalms today that give us some examples of how we can praise God, things that we can praise God for in our prayer. So Psalm 95, let's pray before we move on. Father, we're thankful that <coughs> you give us examples of who you are and what you've done and tell us uh, the best ways to talk to you and I just pray that you would open up your word to us now, your power be on this message, and that we come away even more thankful for, for you. In your name, amen. So our first point today is praising God for his greatness, which we're going to find in Psalm 95. So look with me at verse 1 of Psalm 95. It says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with, sing, with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. So these first three verses are telling us we should praise God. And it says we should praise him for his greatness. Well, what kind of greatness? We'll keep on going. Look at verse 4. It says, In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. So in this verse... The psalmist is saying that God holds things in his hands. Now, everybody has different hand size. So maybe <clears throat> if you played marbles growing up, maybe you can, depending on your hand size, you can hold a certain amount of marbles. Well, some, some people like NBA players, basketball players, this is, a, this is an imprint of one of the basketball players' hands, and that's an average person's hands, showing you how big some people's hands can be. So maybe a person like that could, can hold a lot. Well, what can God hold in his hands? How great is he? Well, it says in this verse, the deep places of the earth. Now, have you ever heard of the Marianas Trench? It is seven miles below sea level. Do you think you could swim to the bottom of that? Now, first of all, you probably don't have enough breath, but if you get far enough down, it'll just crush you like a, like a tin can. Well, it says that God holds that in his hand. Not only does he hold that in his hand, the end of the verse, he says, in the, the strength of the hills is his also. Now, hills here is talking about mountains. Now, if any state in the United States knows about <coughs> mountains, it's Colorado, right? We have lots of mountains. We actually have what's called 14ers. Those are mountains that are above 14,000 feet. Does anybody know how many 14ers we have? 
52, 54, depending on how you count them. So that's a lot. And you know, you, you drive past a lot of these 14 areas, you think, oh yeah, that, that's pretty big. But if you ever try to hike one, you really see how big these mountains are, because it takes all day to get up, up to the top and back. So you see how big those are. But 14ers are not the greatest mountains in the world. You ever heard of Mount Everest? Mm -hmm. That's about twice the size of a 14er. And it takes expeditions weeks to get up and down that mountain. God holds the deep places in his hand, as well as all the mountains, all fit in his hand. Not only does he, can he hold all that? Look what the next verse says. Look at verse 5. It says, The sea is his, and he made it, and in his hands formed the dry land. So this verse is saying not only does he hold all this in his hands, <coughs> he created it. We talked about this in Sunday school. Have you ever tried to create something out of nothing? It'd be kind of handy if you're hungry, right? You know, just, I want a hamburger. It just came to be. Now, we can't create things into existence. God spoke and all of this, all of his creation just came into being. So he's great in that he holds all these things. He's great that he created all these things. Then look at verse 6. It says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. To the, today, if ye will hear his voice. So a key phrase talking about God's greatness in those verses, it says, Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. So God's created everything around us, but have you ever stopped to think how amazing it is that God created us and how intricate our bodies are? For instance, so our body is made up of cells, you could say molecules, and God individually created each one of these, wove them all together, and you ever stop to think about how many cells or how many molecules are in our body? <coughs> Someone estimated that there are three times 10 to the 13th amount of cells in our body. That means, if I, if I can think about this right, that means 310 with then 13 zeros after it. That's a huge number. That's the, how much cells are in a person's body. God created all of those. So God is a great God, and we think about all how big he is and all that he created. So and as we're praising, or praising God in prayer, one of the things we can praise him for is his greatness. And then the next thing we're going to see is praising God for his forgiveness, love, and goodness. So turn to Psalm 103. This is the other psalm we're going to be looking at, <coughs> Psalm 103. This is a psalm written by David. And in Psalm 103, verse 1 says, The psalm of David, Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. <coughs> so this psalm is similar to the last psalm, but it starts off saying we should praise God, and in this psalm, it's saying we should praise God because of his benefits. Well, what benefits? Look at verse 3. It says, Who, talking about God, forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. So this is talking about God's forgiveness. And it says here to, to, to think about, first of all, all of our iniquities, which means sins. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about how much we sin, but let's just say, for example, that we sin three times a day, which, I don't know, for me, that would be doing really well. So I think that's a little low for me. But let's say you're selfish at one point, or you lie at some point, or you get angry at some point. So three sins a day. Well, that means that we sin about a thousand times a year. And that means if we live about 80 years, that means within our lifespan, we've sinned 80,000 times. And the Bible says that every time we sin, it's like we're personally attacking God. You can think about it like we're spitting in his face every time we sin. And we've done that at least 80,000 times. And we're doing that against the holy, infinite king of the universe. Because of that, we're going to see later on this passage, we deserve punishment. But what, what does God do? In verse 3, he tells us he forgives it all. Just like we talked about 
at the beginning of the service that I read this morning that we have this list of grievances against us. It's like if you committed all these crimes and you go before a judge and they read up all those crimes, if you put your faith in Jesus to be your savior and repented of your sin, all that sin taken away. That list, gone. It's kind of like if you, let's say you're mining for gold and you find some rocks that you don't, you don't need, you just throw them over your back and forget about it. When God forgives us, it's like he takes all that sin, puts it behind his back, and doesn't think about it anymore. So we can praise God for his forgiveness, and continuing with this forgiveness idea, look at verse 4. It says, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. This verse goes into a little bit about how God was able to forgive us. He says here, a key word at the beginning of verse 4 is redeemeth, or in other words, redeem. That's a, from the Hebrew word where God brought the children of Israel out of slavery from Egypt. So he redeemed us from something, and he says in this, this verse, from destruction. We deserve eternal punishment for what we've done, but God was able to redeem us, buy us back from that destruction. You can think about it like this, that it's like we were in a slave market. We were a slave to sin, and the devil was our owner. It's like we were in a slave market, and God was walking down, and he saw us, and he said, you know what? I want to make them a part of my family. What do I need to do to, to get them to no longer be a slave, be part of my family? And the only way that could happen was for God to sacrifice his own son so that we could be taken away from that slavery. I think most people in that case would not sacrifice their own child for a slave, but that's what God did for us. He loves us so much. He sacrificed his child so that we could be taken away from slavery and made a part of his family. That's what it took for God to forgive us. It wasn't an easy thing at all. So we can praise him for his forgiveness. And this verse also says here, that he crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. So, I think it would be kind of cool to everybody to wear a crown, right? They look kind of cool, they're all, they're all nice looking, but back in the day, the only person that could wear a crown was a king. It was, it, was a, it was a blessing, it was a benefit that the king got to have. Well, it says here that God crowns us with loving kindness. So we can praise God for his love, and this this idea of loving kindness means a love that will never, ever go away. You can think about it. A funny example would be, so we have a lot of stray cats around here. If you feed a cat, is that cat ever going to leave you? No, he's going to always come back, right? It's a love <coughs> that will never go away. Well, this is saying that God's love for you, no matter what you do, it will never, ever go away. Even if we're unfaithful to him, his love will never be unfaithful to us. He loves you so much. So we can praise him for his love, and it also says here his tender mercies. So we can praise him for his mercies. And one of the ways that God shows his love, look at verse 5. It says, Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle's. So he starts off with that verse saying, who satisfied thy mouth with good things. Have you ever had a meal that was just so good that you just want to sit there and just think about how good it was? Maybe you had, you know, a fantastic steak and it's just, you just want to sit there and just enjoy it. it it's satisfying, right? It's, it's a good thing. Well, he's likening God giving us good things to like eating a good meal. But God doesn't just give us food. God satisfies us with so many good spiritual blessings, first of all, but also so many good physical things. And really, when you think about it in the, the scope of history, we are some of the most physically blessed people throughout all of history. Because through most of history, only one person or maybe a few people in each kingdom got to really do whatever they wanted, meaning that they had... Uh, entertainment whenever they wanted, they were comfortable, they had food, they had transportation, they had everything they, they really needed. And that was the king or the royalty. 
Well, today in our, our, our nation, in our culture, in this day and age, everybody gets to live like kings. Now, granted, we, you know, we all still have uh, financial problems, and there's still hardships, but when you consider how much we have compared to most people that have ever lived, God has poured out blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon us. So we can praise God for his goodness as well. And then, uh, continuing with the idea of mercy, which he talked about earlier, and forgiveness, jump down to verse 12. Verse 12 of Psalm 103. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So we talked about early that, earlier that when you ask forgiveness for your sin, God takes it away. I love how this is phrased. This is one of the best ways to phrase how far away he's taking these sins from us. He says, as far as the east is from the west. Now when you think about that, when you're looking at a globe, you're like, well, you know. They connect again, right? Well, think about it more like all of space, like going in one direction this way, and you go all one direction in the, the next way in space. They're never going to meet. As far as you can think, that's as far as God has separated your sins from you. So all the selfishness, all the pride, all of the lying, God has separated that from you as far as the east is from the west. I love the song that says, how far, how far is the east is from the west, one scarred hand to the other. That's what it took for God to separate that sin that far from us. Once again, talking about his love and his mercy. And then a good way to portray God's love and how he deals with us, look at verse 13. It says, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Now, what the King James word used here is pity, and I, maybe it's just me, but whenever I think of the word pity, this is what I, sorry, this is what I think of. <laughs> pity the fool, right? I don't know if you ever seen the A-team back then, but uh, it's not the idea of God, you know, I, I pity you. No, it, it can, you can translate it as love. So how much does God love us? How, what is his relationship like with us? It says as a father. And I think you know how much you love your kids. Well, since God is infinite, you can take whatever love you have for your kids and multiply it by infinity, and that's how much God loves us. That's amazing, because we're sinning against God, and he says, you know what? You, I am your father, and I love you so much. For God to put himself in that kind of position with us as a father, after all we've done, it's just amazing. And when you consider who we are, it's just even more amazing. Because look what it says in 14 through 16 about who we really are. It says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. What this is saying here is, I, I don't know, any of you grow flowers? Do they last all year? Like, do you plant your flowers and then 40 years later they're still there? No. no. Yeah, especially around here, the frost gets them, right? Well, they're here in God. This is what's. This is how it's comparing our life. You say, well, my life seems pretty long. Well, compare that to someone who's lived from eternity past and will live from eternity future like God. Our life really is here and gone. It's like, so this describes as a flower of the field or the wind, it's just here in God, it's, it's quick. So when you consider how small and short-lived our life is and that we've sinned against God, and yet he says, I love you, I've forgiven you, I've given you mercy, and I'll give you good things. When you consider how great God is and how small we are, it just heightens his love for us. And then you could sum up the whole um, chapter in verse 17, look at it. It says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto his children's children. So he says here, you know how much I love you? I have loved, God says, I love you. I have loved you from eternity past. So from eternity to when you were bo been born, I've loved you. From now till eternity in the future, I will continue to love you. He says, I have so much love for you, I can't show it to you in one instance. 
it's going to take all of eternity to show you how much I love you. So these psalms that show us all these things that we can praise God for in prayer. But before we conclude um, on um, how to pray, first of all, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Have Do you realize that you have that list of sins that we've talked about? And that God, if you ask forgiveness for your sins, put your faith in Jesus to be your Savior, God can wipe that out. Do you see that you need a Savior so that you can have a relationship with God and go to heaven when you die? If you have not done that, talk to me or talk to someone how you can know for sure um, you're saved. And then today, I hope you're seeing that as we're talking about ways to pray, that first of all, we're not just doing it because this is just what good Christians do, but that we're doing this because it's joyful, because it's wonderful. And that we're also not just coming up with a single prayer and just memorizing it. Because maybe you're not a fan of, of memorizing, or you just have to sit there and memorize. I don't think anybody loves memorizing in the first place, but then you know, maybe you struggle with that anyways. Well, we're not saying you just have to memorize a prayer and you just say it. We're just giving ideas on what you can do when you pray. You still make it your own. But I, I do find that the, the PRAY acronym can be helpful at organizing uh, our prayers. And so as we've been talking about the P, the praise part of it today, uh, these Psalms told us that, first of all, we can praise God for his greatness. Now, a personal preference that I have when I'm, when I'm praying is, if possible, I like to either be outside or look outside. You don't have to do this, but one of the reasons I like doing this, and we talked about this a little bit in Sunday school, one of the reasons I like doing that, because when I look at the sky and just think about how vast creation is in the universe, and then when I even look down and see the, the grass and how intricate that is, and just thinking about all the cells that go into that, and that God spoke all this into existence, that he's holding this all together, he's controlling everything, it first of all reminds me there's a God. Because it's not like I wake up in the morning thinking, oh, there is no God, but when I look at creation, it just helps remind me the reality of God. And then also when I think about this God that created everything and is infinite, it puts me in the right mindset to get into these next part, which is what we saw in Psalm 103, which is his forgiveness, his love, his goodness. You can put mercy up there. When I think about how big God is, and then like that Psalm 103, talk about how small I am. And then when I think about how much he loves me, and he's forgiven me, and he's good to me, that is so beneficial. So when it comes to prayer, when I'm praising him, you can, you can think about it in two categories. You can think about it as thanking God for spirit, his spiritual goodness to us, thanking him for, like we just talked about, his love, his goodness, his mercy. Thank you for uh, sending Jesus for me. Thank you for salvation. But then you can also thank him for the physical blessing, the physical good things he's given us. Um, and so when you're, when you're doing that, it can be very beneficial because I don't know about you, but some days you can just wake up and your whole day you can just be kind of down. You can be angry. You can just be kind of down in the dumps. But when you start off your day thinking about all the good things God has given you, like the song, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One, when you do that, it's amazing how your attitude on the day has changed. You're starting to look up instead of down. So that's where it can be very helpful. So I also wanted to, in these next couple of weeks, also to give some tips on when praying. And you don't have to take these tips. These are just things that, that I find helpful. But I first of all want to give a tip on praying in the morning. So I, I do think it is important to start your day off in the correct mindset. So I think a, a good practice could be um, when you get up to to read your Bible and pray, but you might have to you have to figure out what works for you because maybe this is true of you. There's some people for coffee. Yeah. Where before you had your coffee, you're just no good to the world, right? So maybe you need to have, have your coffee, take a shower, your breakfast, whatever you need to do to kind of get awake. But then to 
get into the habit of finding a place where you can have private time with God, where you can read his word, hopefully get something out of it, and then also to pray. That, that is the prime time to where you can really go in depth on praising God. Because we're going to talk about you know praying before a meal and how that's kind of a shorter prayer. This is your prime time to just really think through all that God has done and praise him for it. And we're not just praising him for it because that's what I need to do, or even that's just what God deserves, because that, that is true. But it's so beneficial for us, because it helps remind me of these things, and it helps bring the joy and peace and love that comes about when I think about all that God is and what he's done for me. So I encourage you to take that time to really try to delve in and just think about all that God is and praise him for it. And then, like I said, praying before a meal. Now, you don't have to do this. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you need to pray before a meal. It's not like it makes you more spiritual or that God won't bless the food if you don't pray. But it can be a helpful thing because it you can always use more prayer. And it also shows your dependence on it. And you say, well, how do I incorporate praise into that part, too? Well, you don't want to make it wrong, because maybe you're like me when the food gets in front of you. You're like this. And if someone's praying a long time before a meal, I can just get angry, right? So obviously you don't want to go real in-depth here, but I, I find it's helpful to, even when you're praying for a meal, just add a couple praises about God in that. So, you know, before we say, bless the food to our bodies, just say, God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your with, that you're with, you're with me. And bless us for your bodies that are about to be. Amen. And it's just trying to add as much praise in as you can in these different areas. And then another way that we can praise God in prayer is that hopefully when you're reading your Bible, whether that be in the morning or maybe during kids' nap time or, or in the evening, whatever works best for you, that you're getting something out of it. So that, way, so that way, as you get something out of it that you can think about and apply to your day, maybe you're like me and you have to write it down on a, like a three by five card because otherwise you'll forget it. So to pull it out and when I think about what I read this morning, to praise God for it. So, so it could be real quick. So like I said this morning, God, God has canceled the record of debt that stood against me. I could just read that and be like, God, thank you that all my sins are forgiven. And just something quick like that. So these are just tips on how I can get this praise part of prayer into my day. And it's amazing as you insert this, this kind of praise and prayer to your day, how that can really change your day and bring you so much joy and love and peace through that. So ultimately, let's just praise God that, we, that he is so loving and merciful and forgiving and good to us. So let, let's praise him for that, and let's enjoy those things this week in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that, that even though we are so small, and even though that you are so great, and even though that we've messed up, you've chosen to love us anyways. That you sacrificed your own son so that we could be saved from the slavery of sin. So that we can be united with you and have this relationship so that we can be with you in heaven when we die. You're so merciful and forgiving and your love for us will never go away. No matter what we do, your love for us does not change. It is always there. It is always faithful. Even though we mess up, you continue to shower good thing upon good thing upon good thing upon us. God, I pray that you would help us to enjoy a relationship with you this week that we would see how joyful and satisfying it is to walk with you. Pray that you give us the power to put a priority on that, that you give us the power to, to take time out of our busy schedule and read your word and pray. And we just thank you for this opportunity to know you in your name. Amen.